By the end of World at War, Zombies was still very much a cult classic mode. The fans that it did have were really passionate about it and really loved it, but on the developer side, it was still very much a side project. It was secondary to the multiplayer, and the team was limited in the amount of resources they had and what they could do. Just a couple years later though, by the time we got to the end of Black Ops 1's life cycle, it had now fully matured and was now an integral part of Treyarch's Call of Duty entries going forward. Fully supported and entirely its own thing. To make that very apparent, the fourth and final DLC for Black Ops 1 was nothing but Zombies content. There were no multiplayer maps to support it at all, Zombies was now standing entirely on its own. The centerpiece of the Resurrection DLC was a map that it felt like they poured everything they had into. A map that really embodied the passion that the developers had for the mode. That map, of course, was Moon. I'll destroy you for what you've done to that. It's honestly hard to even start talking about it, there are just so many new things in every single aspect and corner of Moon. From the player's perspective, the first thing you see when you load into Area 51 for the first time is that there's no round counter. Historically, the mode had been built on a game loop borrowed from tower defense games where you deal with a horde, then you get a short break in between to kind of reset and recharge, and then the next wave comes at you with a jump in difficulty. In this one small area, the zombies would instead constantly be spawning in infinitely, steadily getting more difficult over time and giving you no chance to get a break. In isolation, stretched over a full map of its own, this wouldn't be as engaging of a game loop as the conventional round-based gameplay. But, putting it on here as a prologue to a classic style map was a great way to allow them to add variety without losing that core. Even going so far as adding things like a timer showing how long you survived in that area, which wasn't really a variable that most players considered when they were just trying to get higher in rounds. With you in Area 51 was not a lot of utility. You only had the Pack-a-Punch, which you would come back to later, and one single perk machine. Because you could stay there for as long as you could survive, you'd be able to slowly build up points and start the main game on Moon having already bought Juggernog. That really changes the power curve of the game, and while that sense of starting off weak and slowly accumulating power over time is important to the flow of zombies, on this one map that really felt like a celebration of the mode and was more of a playground to explore, it was a nice way to reward a skilled player by allowing them to skip the setup and get straight into the meat of the game. Once you'd decided you'd spent long enough on the ground, with or without getting upgrades, you could teleport up to the moon proper. And it's important to put into context how crazy this felt at the time. Since then, zombies maps have featured dragons or aliens from other dimensions, but at the time, everything had felt relatively grounded. At the very least, every map had taken place on Earth. We were now starting to see the team really break away from that historical military Call of Duty formula. This being the moon, you would immediately start to suffocate and have to grab one of the PES spacesuits right in front of you. You would also immediately notice that any of those areas with low oxygen were also low gravity, which really changed the feel of the movement as both you and the zombies bounced around in near zero G. While in theory this sounds like it would just be across the board easier because everything is basically moving in slow motion, it actually added a lot of interesting complexities because you had to rely a lot more on momentum and you would find yourself overshooting your target if you took one too many bounces. Zombies were also harder to corral and train up because they also had a lot less control and they were overshooting where they wanted to go. It even added an element of verticality because with the right angle and a running start you'd be able to fully clear a zombie if you tried to jump over it. It was a single mechanic with a surprising amount of different dimensions and a lot of room for experimentation and exploitation, but the real beauty of it is that they didn't linger on it. They briefly brought it back for Der Eisendrack, but for the most part it was only on this one map. And that's the philosophy that I find so fascinating about zombies, and the reason I wanted to do this whole series at all. Almost every map introduced at least one new thing, whether it be an item or a mechanic of some kind, that really had a lot of depth, and if they really wanted to, could have been stretched out and used multiple times. But instead you always got the impression that they were always trying to make sure that every map felt unique, and every single one evolved the mode. They were very careful to never stagnate or linger on their success, they were always looking forward. And one thing they definitely did in Moon was introduce a lot of new things, often going so far as to introduce individual elements that themselves had multiple different functionalities built into them. The first example there was the Hacker, which is where the oxygen mechanic really came into play. So this was a piece of equipment that used the same slot as the spacesuit, so if you were holding it you wouldn't be able to breathe in the outdoor areas. 
but it did a lot of interesting things of its own. So it created a real risk-reward mechanic where you were choosing between survival and safety and utility. You could do things like hack a perk machine to refund that perk, you could transfer points between players, open doors for a fraction of the cost, get rerolls on the box, and of course, prevent the excavators from breaching. This one item had so many different things built into it, which just goes to show how exponentially complex Moon was, and how the developers were really holding nothing back and making sure that this was an exciting and content-filled finale for the mode that they loved just as much as the players. That same philosophy was seen in the QED, which was a tactical grenade that took that idea of multifunctionality and turned it up to 11. Every single time you threw one, it would completely randomly pick an effect off a list of upwards of 30 different things. It could be something as simple as opening a door near you for free, or instantly pack-a-punching one of your guns, maybe spawning a random power-up, or even a red power-up that the zombies could interact with to hurt you, like taking away ammo or points. By definition, it's not something you can use tactically, because you never know if you're going to even get something good or bad, let alone something helpful in a given situation. It's more just something you pick up in the later rounds when a game's been running long, and you just want to see what kind of goofy thing is going to happen next. There's really no reason to include something like this at all, except that the developers had a bunch of different ideas, and they weren't limiting themselves to trying to tie everything back into one perfect, ideal way to play. They were really just trying to add a bunch of different tools for you to play around with. Even the wonder weapon for the map had multiple different uses. You got it out of the box in the form of dual-wield zap guns, which fired single, precision, insta-kill shots on single zombies, but at will, you could convert it into the wave gun. This secondary form is a much more traditional wonder weapon in that it was a lot like the thunder gun, where it fired out a blast in front of it, and any zombies caught in that radius would start to decompress and be insta-killed that way. The moral of the story is, the player just had so many options in front of them, and every game of Moon felt unique. It was the perfect map to be left with for the two years we had to wait for the next Zombies game. Moon was just overall a huge finale where they were holding nothing back, and that was not only in the gameplay, but also in the story. Over the course of the easter egg, you actually finally confronted Samantha Maxis, who had been the main antagonist in every map so far. When Richthofen then swapped places with her and took control of the zombies, the players were the ones who launched the rockets that literally destroyed the earth and made it uninhabitable. It was just such a wild quest from beginning to end, and that final set piece of blowing up the earth is one of the most memorable of any easter egg to this day. Putting all that power and responsibility in the player's hands was just so much fun to play through and had everyone theorizing about where they could possibly go from there to escalate it further. Every game always tried to send off their last map with some big event or new story revelation, but Moon was just a masterclass in how everyone was so universally hyped at that climactic end to Black Ops. Looking all the way down the line to Black Ops 4's Tag Your Toten, which was not only the finale to that game, but the end of the entire zombie storyline as we'd known it, by comparison that ending was much more reserved and quiet. That was obviously very intentional, and there are merits to that approach, but it just goes to show that nothing ever reached that same bombastic celebration of the absurdity and goofy fun that the zombies mode has to offer. And all of that is still nowhere near the extent of the new things that the map introduced. You had things like the boss zombie of the map, the astronaut, who was a little bit like George Romero in that he would repeatedly spawn in every time you killed him and slowly walk towards you trying to grab you. If you did get caught in his range, he would grapple you, steal a perk, and then teleport you to a random location on the map, which could be dangerous if he teleported you outside and you were currently holding the hacker instead of the spacesuit. Losing the perk alone was enough of a threat, so it added a real sense of tension to the map, as you were scared to get close to any sliding door or go around any tight corner in case the astronaut was there and you wouldn't see him until it was too late. Moon wasn't a particularly scary map, especially compared to early World at War maps like Verrucht. But, things like the much more muted sound design, the isolation of just the concept of being lost in space, and the fact that the astronaut could be around any corner made it so that when you played this map, you felt this uniquely quiet sense of fear at all times. A new perk was added, Mule Kick, which as part of the bonus content for this DLC was also added retroactively to every other map in Black Ops. For a steep 4,000 points, which was the most expensive perk in the game and second only in price to Pack-a-Punch, you'd now be able to carry a third weapon with you. Although, important to note is that if you ever lost that perk for any reason, you would also lose the gun that you purchased with that power, so you had to be tactical about what you invested in. You. Instead of just a single easter egg song on the map, there were actually multiple ones hidden around, a mix between originals, remixes, and even a guest song from Avenged Sevenfold. 
To pack a punch, you had to go back to Area 51 where you started the game, which meant that you had to get everyone in the lobby to coordinate and get on the teleporter at the same time, which was the last time you saw them forcing that coordination. That was an experiment that they dropped after this map, realizing that it pretty much ruined public lobbies. Excavators around the map randomly triggered, giving you a warning before breaching a previously pressurized area and both blocking it off and also removing the oxygen. If you wanted to prevent that, you had to drop whatever you were doing even if it was in the middle of a round to grab the hacker and take it back to the control room. There were so many different variables to keep track of that every single game on Moon played completely differently, and there was always something going on to keep you engaged and entertained. To compare the two finales that we've seen so far, Doris felt like it took a look back at the maps that had come before, took those elements from there, and refined them down into a single perfect package. It obviously evolved the mode in its own way by introducing Pack-a-Punch, but the main focus was to take everything that had been learned throughout World at War and distill it down into something that worked perfectly, something that was carefully crafted. Moon, on the other hand, went in a different direction. It of course still built on everything that had come before, but then on top of that, it took so many risks and added in a bunch of different elements that hadn't yet been tested in previous maps. And it didn't all work perfectly. Some of the randomness especially was definitely frustrating to run into over the course of a long run or multiple different games. But even still, you could feel that every single aspect of the gameplay and every corner of the map was built with a genuine passion for the mode. It was a celebration of zombies, a love letter to the fans, and a promise that they were continuing to commit to improving and innovating in this now beloved game mode.